Hi everyone, welcome to the second reading session of the novel Whirligig. Today we are going to focus on the during reading strategies of making personal connections as well as making mental pictures. Another word for making mental pictures is visualizing. So a really good reading strategy to use is while you're reading to make <clears throat> films or videos within your own mind. I think these two during reading strategies go hand in hand because I know that if I have personally been to a specific place, then I'm more able to make a mental picture of what's going on in the novel. If I, for example, since it talks about Chicago, I've never been to Chicago and I've really never looked into it or researched it or anything like that. Um, then it's harder for me to make a picture or a video in my mind of that. I can use some prior knowledge. Maybe I've heard about Chicago or I might use New York or Boston as a big city. Um, but I think when you're able to literally bring a personal connection into the book, then you can visualize the events um, and characters much better. So we're going to start, start at the top of page eight. Um, Brent just picked up his friend Jonathan to head to Chaz's party. So again, I want to make sure you guys understand that obviously when you're making mental pictures or you're making personal connections, you're not really talking out loud. I mean, if you want to, that's completely up to you. I'm demonstrating these reading strategies because as we go through the book, um, I'm going to expect that you do it on your own. So it's just kind of me modeling those behaviors. Get on the east-west tollway, said Jonathan. The new song by Rat Trap was on the radio. He turned it up until the dashboard vibrated. Then we'll take the tri-state north. Then we'll cut over. I'll tell you where. And you're sure it's okay, me coming? Trust me, I'm his friend. You're my friend, therefore you and Chaz are friends. As was proven by Theorem 50 in Chapter 6, stop worrying, it's party time. Jumping from one freeway to another, they zigzagged across Chicago. Brent had his doubts about Jonathan's logic, but at least he was certain Brianna would be there. This was a chance to be with her without risking actually asking her out, to be seen with her, to make a statement, to take the next step. Maybe more than one. They found the house clustered with cars as if it were a magnet. Cherokee, Honda, BMWs, another Cherokee. Brent knew all their models and prices. Judging by the crowd, he figured they were on the late side, which was fine. It gave the impression he had other, more important things on his schedule. He parked and put on his headphones. They approached the stone house. So right now I'm having a hard time um, understanding why Brent would actually put on headphones when you're getting out of a car to go to a party. That would kind of suggest to me a loner or what is even the point of going if you're not going to socialize. So in my hand I have, you know, my visualization of Brent kind of with, you know, earbuds like this or even the ones now that you guys wear without the cords, um, you know, walking into this house. It was vast and turreted, looming above them like a castle. Brent reached for the knocker, but Jonathan opened the door as if it was his own. Hey, it's a party, remember? Inside the room seemed too large, the ceilings too high. Brent felt out of scale. No one seemed to be around. He trailed Jonathan through the labyrinth, at last emerging onto the back patio. Music was booming from a sound system to their right. Below them, and the tennis court and on the grass, and inside the gazebo, lounged the cream of the junior class. Brent felt he'd gained a glimpse of Olympus. And Olympus is just a reference um, to Greek and Roman mythology. I think it's Greek mythology, for those of you who are like, what the heck are they talking about Olympus? It was dusk. They wandered toward the others. Then Brent noticed something. He grabbed his friend's arm. Is there a dress code or something? Jonathan stopped. Then he saw it too. Everybody was wearing either all white or all black. So please take a moment and on page nine, I want you to underline 
very lightly where it says Jonathan stopped, then he saw it too, everybody was wearing either all white or all black. And then just note conflict again. We are going to return to those, um, I believe, in before reading session three. Jesus! Jonathan smacked his head then grinned. Forgot again. Forgot what? Brent knew the panic had shown in his voice. You were supposed to wear white or black like chess pieces. Chaz has some big party game dreamed up. So I'm going to pause a moment and say, so first of all, I am making a personal connection. Um, there were a lot of times, especially during middle school and high school, that I felt embarrassed or who was humiliated in front of other people. Um, so I can really connect to how Jonathan is starting to freak out because he doesn't have the right dress code on. Um, and then in my head, I'm also visualizing, you know, everybody being in black and white shirts um, and Jonathan um, being with his ripped jeans and um, Brent being in his bull shirt with his baseball cap and his khakis. So, Brent glared at his friend. He felt he'd been tricked. Fury rose up in him from a deep well. He'd been a headbanger as a toddler and still threw tantrums when he didn't get his way. He knew he couldn't afford a tirade here. He pulled off his headphones and tried to form his reply. Again, just I made this little, I think it's called an ellipse or whatever. You can just make some kind of notation that this again is conflict that Brent is experiencing. Relax, said Jonathan. Chaz always has a theme. Check out the tennis court. It's a big chess board. Must have used chalk. He loves this kind of thing. He's in drama club figures. He eyed Brent. Don't sweat it. He moved on, robbing Brent of his lines. Without Jonathan next to him, Brent felt conspicuous. Everything about the party made him nervous. Then the thought hit him that he would leave. He stuck out enough already without the added business of the clothes. This was the time before the party game started, whatever it was. Down on the tennis court, two figures in white were rollerblading. He debated, teetered toward flight, started to leave, then sighted Brianna. The balance swung. He trotted and caught up with Jonathan, walking beside him as if nothing had happened. Then each felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Chaz. A yellow shirt and blue jeans, he inquired. He affected the headmaster's English accent, sternly surveying Jonathan. He was tall and long-jawed, his sandy curls topped by a gold crown. Really, Mr. Kovitz, this will lower your grades. Learning to follow directions is vital both to your success at Montfort and in the wider world beyond, regardless of what pathetic, godforsaken piece of it you occupy. Jonathan smirked. I thought school was over. He viewed Chaz's crown and fingered his black cape. Not to mention the Middle Ages. Anyway, I don't have a car at the moment, so Brent here drove me. I figured you could use an extra pawn or two. So again, I just quickly, you know, even almost unconsciously made a personal connection um, when he said the Middle Ages. When I was a teacher down at York Middle School, we had a day where, um, I think it was the Elizabethan era, where everybody would dress up um, as Shakespeare, Shakespearean times, and they would roast a huge whole pig, and yes, you, the whole pig, tail and eyes and all. Um, and we would put on skits or plays. So that just made me think of that. That's the kind of personal connections that you do. And as you get older, you make them more unconsciously. Chaz took stock of Brent's cat's up red bull shirt. Points off, he said. He dropped the accent. Brent Bishop, right? Brent nodded his head. Bishop. Like the chess piece, Chaz mused. Let's see if he moves back and forth diagonally the way a bishop should. He stood behind Brent, put both hands on his shoulders, and guided him toward the left. Brent resisted at first, then complied, allowing himself to be treated like a toy, hating his helplessness. Abruptly, Chaz reversed direction, pulling Brent stumbling backward. Works fine to the left. Let's try the right. People were watching. Brent felt like slugging Chaz, but knew his tormentor was taller, 
more muscled, and the de facto ruler of their class besides. That means Chaz is like the most popular kid in their class. If Chaz said that easy listening music was hip, then it was. Losing his cool here would be suicide. Seems to be in good working order, said Chaz. He stopped, then turned Brent to the left. Bishop to drinks table, he called out in chess move fashion. Struggling not to trip, Brent was marched across the grass through a circle of girls and up to the table. He felt Chaz's hands release him and prayed his host would vanish. He did. He replaced his headphones to help shut out the scene and stood staring, dazed, at the bottles before him. He felt as if he were still on stage. Playing to his audience in his own need, he poured himself a scotch and soda, heavy on the former. He had a dice and sipped it quickly, feeling it run through him like a river of lava. Discreetly, he scouted the territory. The smell of pot smoke reached his nostrils. He spotted Jonathan and a group of boys on the lawn and headed that way. The talk was of the Cubs. Brent marveled that people could publicly root for such perennial losers. So again, I'm just making a... Um, personal con connection as well as actually a mental picture. I'm, you know, imagining in my head a bunch of high school kids, um, boys in particular, standing around talking about um, the Red Sox in this case because I'm not a Cubs fan. Um, and although it differs because obviously uh, the Red Sox have won a lot, whereas, you know, perennial losers for the Cubs mean that they lose all the time, I can still see how that conversation would go. The Bulls in basketball were different. They won. Both he and his father had bought Bull shirts their first week in Chicago. He, his own stood out less among the whites and blacks as darkness fell. Then lights came on above the tennis court and inside the gazebo. The human chess game will commence in 30 minutes, Chaz announced from the patio. Should be interesting, said the boy next to Brent. The subject switched to hockey. Brent pretended to listen, sipping his drink and watching Brianna. He wanted to catch her alone. At the moment, she was talking with two other girls. She was drinking a beer and had a sullen look, her wavy blonde hair reaching down her black dress like a hanging garden. His knowledge of her was sketchy. In his two months at Montfort, he'd learned that she'd recently broken up with someone, that she stood near the top of the pecking order, and that her father, rumor had it, was worth a hundred million. He also knew for a fact that she was gorgeous. Having her for a girlfriend would mean instant respect. And why shouldn't she like him? He was tall, a little skinny perhaps, a bit uncoordinated, but reasonably handsome, with a square chin and no braces or acne. She was probably sick of the same old faces. She'd smiled at him off and on when they passed. They'd been assigned to the same group project in history. Making use of his newcomer status, he'd often asked her questions about Chicago, offering in return his services in math, his best subject. She hadn't taken him up on it as yet, but finals were coming. He had hopes. He made another drink and returned, his nerves pleasantly numbed by the scotch. He took off his headphones. He was feeling more comfortable, proud of the fact that he could hold hard liquor. On the patio, Chaz had taken off the wrap and put on French-sounding accordion music. It was so corny, it was cool, and somehow fit the moment. A spring evening, the air warm at last, the leaves thrusting from the trees again and crowding out the sky. A faint breeze stirred the greenery. So that's a really descriptive paragraph, and I immediately went to in the spring, which is kind of now, although we've had a really nice spring. Um, so when it really smells good, um, you know, you look up and the green leaves are starting to come up uh, and the air is warmer. It's not that cold, crisp air. You can kind of feel that summery air and it smells great. So that's what I'm imagining based on my personal experiences with a spring um, evening. Around Brent, the talk turned to cars, then gradually focused on Porsches. He heard his cue and roused himself. The 4S really flies, he volunteered, but tons of repairs. Always in the shop. Don't even say the word Porsche to my dad. He drives one, asked Jonathan. I always see him in that Continental. 
back in Atlanta, said Brent, finally sold it. It was that sort of lie that would never be found out, the story he'd drawn on often. Moving had at least that one advantage. Over the years, he'd grown adept at creating alternate paths for himself. He glanced to his right and was returned to the present. Brianna was crossing the grass alone. He slipped from his group and hurried his steps to intercept her. Hi, he said. She looked startled. She hadn't even seen him in the shadows. Hi, she replied flatly, then moved on. He strode beside her briskly to keep up. So, who are you in the chess game? She reached the drinks table and poured herself some vodka. Beats me. She added tonic to her cup. He added scotch to his and sipped it. He lifted the top off the ice bucket for her. She ignored the gesture and walked away. He followed, emboldened by the alcohol, to try to overcome her coolness. So as I'm reading this, I'm seeing a shift in my own scenery. So it's uh, Brent and Brianna and, of course, my own images based on the description in the book. Um, walking around with it kind of dark out, with some lights going on, music. So, um, but they're alone in the grass. That history test was deadly, he offered. Sure was. He tried to fight through the accordant music and the fog in his brain to find something to say, unaware she was headed for the crowded gazebo. He sipped his drink. If you need any help in math, Brianna stopped short, squeezed her eyes shut, then wheeled and screamed, stop hanging all over me. So I'm going to pause and I'm actually going to underline that because clearly that's a conflict. I'm sure that Brent is experiencing um, some embarrassment since she just screamed in front of everybody at the party. So again, on page 14, just lightly underline, Brianna stopped short. And again, I just put conflict. So when we refer back to it, it's easier to do that. They were well lit by the light in the gazebo where Chaz was giving a waltzing lesson. All heads turned toward Brianna and Brent. Conversation stopped. You're like a leech or something. Get off me. Can't you take a hint? Go bother someone else. And that goes for at school too. There was silence, but for the accordion's cheery tune. Brianna stormed up the gazebo steps and disappeared into the crowd. Brent stood, brain and limbs paralyzed as if turned to stone by her curse. He'd never been in such a situation and had no ready response. The music and the black and white figures facing him made him wonder if he was dreaming. Been rehearsing that scene long? asked Chaz for all to hear. Drama club needs you. There was laughter at this. Brent's thoughts tilted crazily. He pictured them all repeating the scene to their friends, replaying it like the sports highlights, goofaring over it at the 20-year reunion. He turned, desperate to get out of the light's glare, and started toward the shadows. Bounding down the steps, Chaz cut him off and placed both hands on his shoulders. Bishop to penalty bench, he called loudly. Ten minutes for sexual harassment. More laughs. He aimed Brent toward a stone bench. The hated grip on his shoulders again, the public humiliation, the snickers, the alcohol, all mixed and detonated inside Brent. He stopped, whirled, throwing off Chaz's hands and swung with all his might. So again, I'm just, that whole paragraph we could underline, but I'm just going to underline, he stopped, whirled, etc., and swung with all his might. Then I'm going to put conflict next to it because clearly getting into a fist fight in the middle of a party with the host is not um, a success story. Jesus came from the gazebo. The blow missed Chaz's face, scraping his ear. Both he and Brent stood in shock, caught off guard, breathless. Chaz's crown had fallen off. Brent aimed a ferocious kick at it, connected, sent it spinning over the grass, then turned and stumbled toward the patio alone. Calling Miss Manners, someone shouted out. Tell her it's an emergency. Y'all come back, Georgia boy. He entered the house, his thoughts swirling. He took a wrong turn, passed through the dining room twice, kicked a wall in frustration, then charged down the hall and found the front door. He left it standing open behind him and steamed toward his car like a torpedo. Jonathan could find another ride home. 
He got in and peeled out. His mind was a wreckage of sound bites and images from the last five minutes, endlessly repeating, shuffled, overlapping. It didn't seem real, but he knew it was. The consequences would be real as well. I'm going to star there. The consequences would be real as well. Because on the front of the book, it said actions have consequences. And this kind of seems a little bit related to that. So I'm thinking maybe a theme, but we'll just put it there. He was a leper now. No one would go near him. Certainly no girl. He destroyed himself. He shut up an entrance ramp. He forgot to tell me about the stupid clothes, he yelled, and the tantrum began. Some stupid, idiotic, goddamn friend. He shouted out the catalog of the knight's injustices, rained punishment on his enemies, wailed at his disappointments and deprivations. The flood of words seemed to bear him down the road. His head reeled with drink and despair. Then he saw that he'd gotten on the wrong expressway. This was 94. They'd come on 294, or so he thought. He rummaged hopelessly through his memory, trying to recall their route. He'd let Jonathan guide him and hadn't paid attention. He fumbled, opened the glove compartment, and let loose a landslide of cassettes. He felt around with his hand. No map. He was nearing Skokie. He began to get nervous. He wondered where 94 led. Then mile by mile, the uneasiness passed. He felt strangely unconcerned. He realized that he really didn't care where he was going. Why should he? His life was a house that had burned to the ground. What was there to go back to? He drove on, weaving slightly, aware that every car but his had a destination. He felt spent, emptied of all will. He was beyond tantrums. Instead, a measured voice began broadcasting within him, soft and unexpected like the, a warm wind out of season. There's no need to go home, said the voice. No need to go back to school on Monday. No need to go there ever again. Ahead, car lights hurtled toward him just as in a video game. He was in the fast lane, staring between the white lights on his left and the reds on his right. There's no need to feel pain. You've already felt enough. The driver beside him honked when Brent drifted into his lane. Brent ignored him. No need to let them hurt you again. The voice flowed through his veins like morphine. He wove between the lights, hypnotized. You have the power to stop the hurting. He removed his hands experimentally from the steering wheel for a moment. No need to be a pawn. He put his hands back. The driver beside him honked once more, then slid several lanes over and sped up. They are the pawns. You are a king. He took his hands delicately off the wheel again. You have a king's absolute power within you. He held his hands in midair for several seconds. They shook slightly. Gradually, he lowered them and laid them lightly on his thighs. He stared blankly at the lights before him. You have absolute power over your own life. He saw that the car was drifting to the left. He felt his hands jerk, but kept them on his thighs. You have the power to end your life now. Very close, very slowly, he closed his eyes. And that's the end of chapter one, party time.